We're gonna kick it off with number one, and this is not using your gear wisely. So it's very common for climbers to get to a position on a route, see a piece of gear, and then place the first piece of gear that they see without taking into consideration the other features and other bits of gear that might be around them. Let's say, for example, you take a double set of cams, and then lower down on the route, you place a red cam. You then get to another piece of gear and the first piece of the gear that you see is again a red cam. If you place that red cam now, then you're not going to have any other options for placing a red cam and it could be crucial higher on the route. Whereas if you actually look around that placement, maybe you can fit like a green or a purple in the back of the red cam slot or you might be able to find something entirely different away from that slot. It sounds really obvious this but a lot of people end up shortchanging themselves because they placed both of those pieces lower down the route and then they find higher up the route it's actually a crucial piece. So just being a little bit wary of what pieces you place and the strategy and order that you place them can stand you in good stead for the remainder of the route. You can also apply this same strategy to the type of gear that you place, so whether that's cams versus wires. So let's say, for example, higher up the route is a really splitter parallel crack. What you don't want to do is you don't want to place all your cams lower down on the route and then leave yourself with only wires to place in a really splitter crack. Number two is having too much sport slack in the system when you're belaying trad routes. In sport climbing, it can be quite nice to have a bit of a loop of slack in the system for a nice smooth wow. and dynamic fall. Often on trad climbing, the ground can actually be a little bit different to sport climbs, unless it's a very sporty style trad climb. And on multi-pitchers, as a belayer, you can't actually move from the belay. I've often found that when the climber goes out of sight of the belayer, the belaying becomes more relaxed. Lower down on the route where the belayer can see the climber, they'd be more attentive, they can see the mates sketching about, having a really hard time. Then the climber goes out of sight, the belaying becomes sort of less attentive. In a way, you have no idea what your mate or what that climber is doing up there. Just because you can't see them, it doesn't mean they're not sketching about like they were lower down on the route. And honestly, I will be the first to admit I am just as bad as all the rest of you at doing this myself. On a multi-pitch, as a B layer, you're actually attached to the B lay. So if you have loads of slack out, a big fall can actually be quite painful for the B layer. What happens is, is as the climber falls off, you as the B layer gets pulled up, your attachment point to the B layer becomes tight, and then you get slammed and pinned into the wall. Now the bigger the fall with the climber, the harder you are gonna get pinned and slammed into the wall. So being attentive as a B layer when the climber goes out of sight will not only reduce the fall for the climber, but will also reduce your pain of being slammed and pinned into the wall. Number three, placing gear as if they were bolts. This usually applies to the overconfident sport climber who has just transitioned from sport climbing to trad climbing. Oh. Oh. So yes, if you do have a splitter crack, then in reality, you are gonna be able to place gear nice and evenly spaced out as if they were bolts. However, realistically, that's not usually the case. Every trad placement has fine details to it, such as the rock quality, the rock type, the flare of the placement. All these things can dictate how good that placement is. Rather than just like plugging and going on every single piece of gear and every single pitch, what you want to do is you want to have a conscious or subconscious rating system about the gear that you're placing. This could be a number from one to five, or it could just be as simple as good, medium, bad. If the gear is a medium or bad placement, then maybe you would consider placing an additional piece or maybe a cluster of pieces, or maybe consider your next piece of gear not to be quite as high and the run out from the last piece not to be as far. I remember a few years back, I was making the second ascent of a reasonably run out route in Sweden. The bottom half of the route was nice and safe and then the top half of the route was really run out and so in the middle section you had to place a bunch of gear. In this section I placed nine pieces of gear in a cluster. On my first attempt I actually fell off and I ripped two of those pieces of gear but obviously I had seven other pieces of gear and I was totally fine. I remember hearing a story of another climber who then came along later and only placed three pieces of gear where I placed those nine and they fell off and ripped all those three pieces of gear and then hit the floor. If there have been a few more pieces placed and a little bit more backup in the system, then maybe that could have been prevented. So the moral here is 
don't always just plug and go. Number four of common mistakes, this is actually using a single rope instead of using double ropes. Because sometimes, not all the time, but sometimes using a single rope can actually be more dangerous than using a double rope. Maybe I just say that because I'm British and we just love using double ropes in Britain and all the Americans are sat there saying, nah, 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 we just want to use single ropes. We love single ropes. But I do think in some circumstances, using double ropes over single ropes is definitely much safer. To determine whether you should use single ropes over double ropes, it all comes down to the positioning of the gear on the route. If the gear follows the natural line of the climb, then using a single rope is totally fine. However, if the gear is dotted around the line of the climbing, or it's out to the side in lots of places, then you're definitely going to want to use double ropes. Using double ropes when the gear is dotted around the climb is basically going to stop the rope zigzagging around the climb. And it's going to make your life as a climber much easier because you're not going to get as much rope drag and the piece of gear that you do place won't be being pulled back to the center of the line of climbing, which means the direction of pull on them is going to stay in the direction that you want it to. Another benefit for using double ropes over a single rope in trad climbing is if you have bad gear or piece of gear that you might rip because you can actually minimize the fall distance by alternating the piece of gear that you clip with separate ropes. We've had a few videos on the channel recently of us using double ropes and lots of people asking what are the benefits of this, why do we do it? So another couple of reasons is one, it's actually really good for multi-pitch climbing in case you need to abseil off the route or in case you need to bail on the route. We can't climb it like it is now. And this is proper rain. It's actually raining. When you have double ropes, you can tie them together and then you can abseil double the distance. Rather than if you had a single rope, you would have to half that rope and then you'd only be able to abseil half the distance. The second reason is it's actually quite good for adventure trad type climbing where there might be loose or sharp rock. Using double ropes can give you a little bit of a backup in case one gets cut or snagged. The fifth and final mistake that trad climbers make, this is not knowing how to jam or just neglecting it altogether. Now I'm not just saying this because obviously we're a crack climbing channel, but crack climbing is an integral part of trad climbing in general. 90% of the time there will be some sort of crack feature on a trad route because cracks are where you place gear. They're where you place cams, they're where you place wires. I'm not saying that every trad route is going to follow like a perfect splitter crack, but where there are cracks where you can place that gear, you might just be able to find those sneaky little jams. And if you can utilize those jams, maybe it's just one or two per route, it could be the difference between success and failure. If you look at all the hardest trad routes in the world, and the majority of them do have some sort of crack feature on that you can utilize for jamming. So I think this just goes to show how important jamming and crack climbing is within trad climbing. It's a massive, massive part of it. If you don't know how to crack climb yet, but you really want to learn, then we have got just the playlist for you. You need to check it out just here.